we're now reaching the academic pinnacle, as it were, of our first day of the conference, <laughs> and it is my honor to introduce to you uh, Professor Kristen Stilt, who is the Deputy Dean and Professor of Law at Harvard Law School, and also the Director of the Animal Law and Policy Program, where I myself was a visitor uh, last year. It's great to have you. Yeah. Uh, Professor still received her JD from the University of Texas School of Law and a PhD in History and Middle Eastern Studies from Harvard University. Her interest in animal studies was peaked uh, when she was conducting research in Egypt for her PhD. While there she became involved with several animal advocacy groups and still helps fund an Egyptian animal rescue project in addition to personally rescuing dozens of cats and dogs off the streets of Cairo. Professor Stilt's research focuses on Islamic law and animal law, exploring in particular the intersection of animal law and religion and culture. We were talking about this before as well. She's currently completing a book manuscript uh, with the Oxford University Press entitled Halal Animals. Professor Stilt was named the Carnegie Scholar for her work on constitutional Islam, and in 2013 was awarded a John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellowship. We are incredibly honored to have uh, Kristen with us here today to deliver the keynote of our first European Animal Rights Law Conference. Please join me in welcoming Professor Stilp for her address on Islamic conceptions of animal Thank rights. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much and thank to, thanks to Sean and Raphael for the invitation and Raphael for visiting us last year, um, as well as to the Brooks Institute for sponsoring the conference. I've been very pleased to, have been, to be involved with the Brooks Institute and more recently to serve on the executive committee. So I'm thrilled that uh, the Institute is supporting this amazing event today. Uh, as Raphael said, I also serve as the Animal Law and Policy Program faculty director, and we have a lot going on there. I won't take time away from this talk to talk about it, but if you'd like to join our email list, you can do that through the website or give me your email address at some time during this conference. So as Raphael said, my first involvement with animal issues in the Muslim world was in Egypt, back when I was a graduate student conducting dissertation research in the country, which was unfortunately not specifically on animal law. At the time, it was only a hobby. Or, uh, and so it, it, I was there in 1999. That was my, the start of multi-year uh, uh, period of, of research there. And I looked for an animal protection organization, uh, such as a shelter, where I could volunteer. The issues with animals there are front and center in the streets every day, feral dogs and cats, maybe a, abandoned pets uh, are living and dying in the streets, getting hit by cars right in front of you. And then there's horses, donkeys, camels, pulling heavy loads, faring around tourists by the pyramids, all in terrible conditions. If you care about animals at all, you notice. You can't not see it. And so I looked for a group I could volunteer with and actually found none. But I found a woman named Amina Abaza, who was in the early stages of starting a shelter and an advocacy organization, uh, which still exists today, she's still quite active, and she had already decided on a name, Society for the Protection of Animal Rights in Egypt. So, the name really struck me, rights? In Arabic, it's haq or hukuk, hukuk al hayawan, animal rights, and the same term haq or hukuk is used for human rights, hukuk al insan. And in 1999, I wasn't as well-versed in American animal law as I am now, but I couldn't even think of an American organization, prominent one, that had the term rights in the title, or at least it wasn't commonly used. I also thought that given how poor the situation was in Egypt, even trying to get some basic welfare protections would be challenging, and rights seemed a lifetime away. But Amina was not thinking in such incremental terms, nor was she burdened by the fact that the phrase animal rights was not widely accepted uh, as a popular phrase or as a, a name for an organization in the US. Instead, she was drawing upon the many publications that were called literally Animal Rights in Islamic Law, which you can find in any bookstore in Egypt. These were modern publications in Arabic, published in Egypt and neighboring countries. And she was also drawing upon what she understood to be the general concept that animals have rights in Islamic law. But what does that mean? <laughs> right? So this talk will focus on that question. 
what, what are the Islamic conceptions of animal rights? And just to give a little preview up front of the takeaway, I'm going to show that Islamic law does recognize that animals have interests, important interests. But this recognition is not uniform for all animals and in all contexts. In some cases, the interest does look something like a right, while in others, the interest is clearly one of welfare. Uh, contemporary advocates, whom I'll get to at the end, can draw upon the Islamic legal tradition to advance the cause of animal rights, but in doing so, they're going to need to use some creative methodologies to prompt a rethinking of some entrenched positions. All right, so the overview of the talk then. I want to cover uh, four areas in about 45 minutes, uh, leaving about a half hour for discussion. So quickly, I just want to give a, a very quick overview of the definition of animal rights in Western contexts. So we have a shared baseline. Raphael went through that this morning, but I'll do it very quickly as well. And then second, I'll turn to Islamic law and history. And I'll begin with a short history on the sources of Islamic law. It's a necessary first step, so we have some shared understanding of what these texts that I'll talk about do. I'll then show how the recognition of the interests of animals are deeply embedded in this tradition. But as I mentioned, not all animals are treated the same in all contexts. Uh, and to preview that, the most significant issue for rights is that animals are permissible to consume. Uh, there are many welfare requirements that go along with that, but it's well established in the doctrine that animals are permissible to kill for the purpose of consuming them. Permissible, not mandatory. And I'll talk about how that could be an opening when I get towards the end and talk about contemporary advocates. All right, so that's the second point. Third, I'll turn to modern advocates, or rights advocates specifically, and to see how they're using the Islamic legal tradition that I will have just covered in part two. They are now taking stronger positions and talking about topics that would have been too sensitive even a short while ago. So I'll focus on an author, scholar, activist, who wrote in the 1980s here in England and died in 1992, Al-Hafiz uh, Bashir Ahmed Masri. Uh, again, he lived in the UK. And then f finally, a young female Muslim activist who is known through Facebook as Farah. And then fourth and finally, I want to put some of the animal rights issues in the broader context of progressive movements within Islamic law more generally and look ahead and see how animal activists, animal rights activists could draw upon some of these other progressive uh, movements to further their cause using Islamic arguments. Um, we'll have some audience participation given that it's four o'clock. If you are asleep or look like you're online shopping, I will call on you. Um, and I'll also say that if something's really not clear and you just can't possibly go on without getting clarification, I don't mind if you raise your hand. I mean, please hold like questions for the end, but if you just can't go on without clarification, I certainly don't mind being interrupted. All right, so first, some background on animal rights. Um, as we know, there's one uniform meaning, as Raphael told us today, and in fact, it's used very widely in public discourse and academic writing. It can be used to mean improvements in the way that non-human animals are treated. Um, in their edited volume on animal rights, Cass Sunstein and Martha Nussbaum suggest that animal rights might be just any protection against harm, or that the law protects animals against cruelty or that possibly it just means affirmative duties on people with animals in their care, or rights could just mean protection against unnecessary suffering. They give all these as possible, possible ones. But scholars identified with the stronger version of animal rights would reject these definitions. So to quote Kimlicka and Donaldson in their chapter on rights in Lori Gruen's volume called Critical Terms in Animal Studies, which is a great volume, by the way, and it's really great for teaching, lots of short essays. Um, uh, for them, animal rights refers to, quote, rights that cannot be violated for the benefit of others. And then in the Oxford Handbook of Animal Studies, Francione and Charlton say that uh, uh, criticized rights for being used by animal advocates, the term rights, animal advocates, institutional exploiters in the media to refer to any position that's favorable to animals. And for them, a straightforward definition is, quote, protecting an interest with a right involves the idea that the interest is important 
and should be protected even if the consequences militate against protecting it. So a very non-utilitarian approach. And rights for human beings were obviously uh, long accepted in the Western context before there was any discussion of animal rights. We had talked today about Peter Singer in 1975, but of course he's calling for the equal consideration of interests and not for animal rights. And really it's Tom Reagan in 1983 that gives us this very systematic, comprehensive approach to animals in his case for animal rights. So I will take the stronger case, the strong case for animal rights as my starting point and look to see what can we see in Islamic law uh, that might reflect them. All right, so the second part, Islamic law in history. So first let's do some essential background, just so we're all on the same page. Islam was born in the Arabian Peninsula, modern-day Saudi Arabia, in the early 7th century, really around the turn of the century. Um, the Prophet, Prophet Muhammad um, died in the year 632. So what's going on at that time in this very arid part of the world? It's a desert, the Arabian Peninsula. Animals were very valuable. Uh, they were not killed and eaten uh, on a daily basis. And camels in particular were used for transportation and were highly valued for their ability to go long distances. Um, meat was by no means a daily occurrence. You would never kill uh, a camel um, who was your sole mean, means of transportation. So meat was eaten very, very rarely. And that will come up a little bit later. And so Muhammad is believed by Muslims to be the messenger of God. In this, uh, in, for Muslims, he revealed God's message uh, over many years, and that message today is put together and known as the Quran. But he also became the leader of a new community of Muslims, and it's a community he created, and he became the political leader as well as the messenger. So he sort of served two roles, a direct line to God, but also an authority in his own right. So in this second capacity, an authority in his own right, things that he did and said that were considered normative became very valuable and indeed a second source of law. So not that he had a preference for this or that or you know, dates over some other kind of, of food, but things he said that people took to mean, ah, oh, that's a general rule, even though they were context specific. And so these, the second source of law is called the hadith, mean a saying, and it turns out to be extremely important because that's where really all the details about almost everything come in. The Quran is not very detailed on, a, on most legal topics. All right, so now you know there's two sources. There's the Quran, there's this, the hadith, which is much more voluminous, but uh, often very difficult to work with for reasons I'll explain. Let's look and see. Do they say anything about animal rights? So we'll start with the Quran. Now, the Quranic verses on animals say a lot about killing animals for food and how to do it, in which animals are permissible. Uh, and they don't, the Quran does not say very much by way of how in general should you treat animals. That's fairly typical of the Quran on the, on the whole to not get into a lot of specifics with the exception of a few topics. Um, but it has some things to say that we, we should talk about here. So, uh, not specific to any one verse, uh, there's a very important book published some years ago, not so long ago, called Animals in the Quran by Sarah Tlili, a Islamic scholar at the University of Florida. And she argues against a very strong consensus among the tra traditional scholars, and in fact many practicing Muslims, that the Quran does not give humans anything like dominion over animals. Right? It is not a, it's not a book that establishes humans as holding some kind of dominion. Rather, it's theocentric. The Quran is God is at the top of the pyramid, and all beings are basically below God and on the same level, uh, created equally as his creation. And so 
her argument is very important because it takes away a general argument often given not only in Islam but Christianity and other religions that human control, human dominion gives humans kind of a per se right to decide what happens to animals. So that's one general point that kind of runs through the whole Quran that I wanted to mention and she's done really important work there. So when animal advocates look for specific verses in the Quran, uh, the verse that's, that seems strongest on animals is, is this one. They quote it all the time. There is not an animal in the earth, nor a flying creature flying on two wings, but they are peoples like you. We have neglected nothing in the book of our decrees, meaning the Quran, then unto their Lord they will be gathered. Now you might be disappointed to see that that is the most prominent Quranic verses that animal advocates cite. Um, but they cite it with this idea that animals are communities like you as evidence that they too should have equal treatment, that they should be treated literally humanely. So this is positive, we would say it's certainly not negative, but it doesn't give us a lot of detail. So there's also another verse which is a little bit opaque in a way, but it serves the, the point of, of kind of an anti-mutilation point. So here the, the, the verse is referring to the devil. Okay? And I will mislead them and I will arouse in them sinful desires and I will command them so they will slit the ears of cattle. And I will command them so they will change the creation of God. And whoever takes Satan as an ally instead of God has certainly sustained a clear loss. So this is intended to, it's been understood and been drawn upon to say, you know, only Satan would mutilate animals or cut, cut the ears. And uh, so we shouldn't do it. I'll say as an aside, this verse has also been used to, to justify uh, anti-sterilization or to say animals shouldn't be sterilized. So it, it has positive uh, uh, uses, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but also this one that's highly problematic. And so that's kind of it when it comes to the Quran. That's really what we can pull out of it to think about what does it tell us about animals. The details all come from the Hadith, the sayings of the Prophet. Um, and so I want to show you some of them, but before doing so, I want to say a little bit more about the context of the Hadith. So recall that they're the Prophet's words and deeds. Uh, the issue is that there was not someone following the Prophet around writing down everything he said. In fact, the idea that his words and deeds would have normative force and become a source of law wasn't really conceptualized until after his death and compilations of the Hadith were not put together until a century or even centuries after his death. And so there was concerns even at the time that are we getting it right? There were concerns about how do you authenticate uh, something when you no longer have a live witness. And so I won't go into the details but the bottom line is that there are some Hadith collections that are considered more authent authenticated or more likely to be the prophet's sayings than others. There's stronger ones, there's weaker ones. So I'm showing you the strong ones. But you should know that ha you happen to be in a conversation with someone and they cite a hadith to you, they're not all equivalent, right? It might be one from a weak collection, it might be one that's kind of considered not authentic at all. Uh, once you wade into conversations about the hadith, you really have to be able to know is it a strong one? Is it a weak one? All right, and then the last thing I'll say is that uh, comment commentators will give their ideas about the meaning of these different hadith, but there's no real definitive view on, oh, this one means this and only that. So your view is as good as anyone's, essentially, uh, on what you think these mean. And so here's where audience participation comes in. I wanna show you several of them, and I want you to say, if they could support the concept of animal rights and how, how might we use them to say these animals have some kind of rights? Okay, so here's the first one. Um, I usually don't like slides with a lot of text, but I think it's nice for you to be able to, to see it and have it as we talk. So here's one. We were traveling with the prophet and he stepped off to the side to attend to his needs when we saw a small bird with her two babies and we took them. The we is his companions. 
Okay? The mother bird came over and began fluttering in the direction of the prophet. So he said, who made her miserable by taking her two babies? Return them to her. All right, so what do you think? Can we use this in any way to support any rights concepts? Good anti-dairy and anti-egg message. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, leave, the, leave the birds alone, right? Don't use them, don't use them for food. We'll later find out, of course, you can use animals for food, but at least not these. What else? Any other ideas? Yeah. And right to family. So, right to family? To, to, be, to stay with your family? Yeah. And states are making her miserable. Yes. So what does that mean? Again, suffering. Suffering. Feelings. Feelings. Emotions. emotions. She has feelings, emotions that are valuable. There's a psychological injury that's wrongful, yeah. And there's also the element that he doesn't balance it out by saying, well, are you really that hungry that you need to eat the eggs? Yeah, or they're just messing with her, right, just for fun. They're just having a good time. They think it's a funny thing to do while the prophet is off um, urinating is basically the way this hadith has been interpreted. So I'm not attributing something disrespectful to, uh, to the prophet. Okay, some kind of, that, that, that she has, uh, that, that these birds have some kind of bodily integrity, bodily liberty, and they shouldn't be taken, right? Any other, any other ways you would read this? Any other ideas? Okay, yeah, sorry? I was gonna say that it, it, um, it gives the profit status as well because they're fluttering in the direction of the projection. Okay, all right. They probably interpret it as that as well, I think. Like, like we do with the Lord as your shepherd. Yeah, they, she knew, right, right? Yeah, that this is wrong, and I'm gonna go tell, tell, tell the person in charge, right? <laughs> yeah, Charlotte? For recognition of animal agency. Agency, okay, I'm gonna protect my babies, I'm gonna go talk to the person in charge. It's also a recognition of the kind of voicelessness of the animal if, if, if it wasn't for the prophet being <coughs> present. There's a kind of recognition that she'd have no recourse. Right, right, so human, not dominion, but human responsibility, perhaps, um, to, uh, to, to listen carefully as to what they're saying, what they need. Yes, right. The followers should look up and say, well, if he's doing it, he's so much higher than I am. Yeah, and so remember I said the hadith, they're not things like the prophet preferred dates at noon. The, what was collected were things that were considered to have normative force. And so merely by being even in the collection, this is not just some random event. We're supposed to take away something about the, uh, the bird's sentience, intelligence, uh, you know, all the things you've just said commentators have said this verse uh, might mean. So, so good job on this one. Okay, ready? An ant bit the prophet and he ordered that the ant colony be burned. God spoke to him and said, because of an ant's bite, you have burned a community that glorifies me? Can we draw any, any rights out of that? Yeah. It kind of brings up Great proportionality, right? Sorry, you know, take it, uh, take out your issue with the ant who bit you, right? Not, not with the entire community. Good. Opposition to like collective punishment. Yeah, totally. No collective punishment. What else? Are you tired of this teacher-student thing yet, or can we keep <laughs> can we keep going? Okay, I'll keep you awake. God's creatures. What? All animals are God's. Creatures. They're all a community that glorifies me. So they're, they're mine in a way, they glorify me. What? You hurt me. You, you hurt me, right? They're, they're mine. Even suggesting that they have some kind of spiritual agency, right? That they actually perhaps look at God left or, yes, 20, 20 by left, yeah. That they actually have some kind of spiritual agency, right? That they might be creatures that, um, that, uh, that, um, bow down to God or look to God as their, their God too. They're not objects, right? Okay. Yeah. I was just thinking, um, in terms of sovereignty, human dominion of animals, 
it's interesting because the prophet decides to kill them, but then God right. rectifies it. Right. So what's going on that I thought it was interesting that the human can make that decision and it makes it actually. And he was wrong. But he's cor corrected by God. He was corrected by God. Mm -hmm. So that's a really good point too. So even the leader whose actions we take to be normative uh, made a mistake and was corrected and it goes in the record, right? So maybe God knows. And that, of course, is the whole idea of Islamic law. Only really God knows and all human behavior is just an attempt to approximate what God wants for humans. Yeah. What about the right to self-defense? Mm, okay. Yeah, I'd be curious to, to go back and look and see what the international law people make of these, make of this, right? Because there's a lot of that you're bringing up. Yeah, Visa? Yeah, just <laughs> on the same point as here, that not only is Muhammad sort of fallible here, but also quite petty. Yes, right. He's, he's a man who overreacted. Yeah. Uh. yeah. I'm wondering how this happened practically. So you're saying <laughs> someone followed the prophet and they wrote in the book what's happened. No, they didn't. I'm saying that's exactly what did not happen. So no one is following the prophet with a notebook because, <laughs> or a, uh, you know, a plank of wood, um, because they weren't thinking at the time he's going to die, there's going to be an Islam after him, right? There's just, there's no contemplation of all these things. And so I'll, I'll give you the 30 second answer. Decades and decades and centuries later, when they're trying to collect them all, people went around and they would say, you know, um, they would say, Claire, did you ever hear from your father, uh, him telling you any stories of, he heard the prophet? And you would say, yeah. In fact, he said that his grandfather said that his grandfather's brother said that his like five chains up that he heard the prophet say uh you know an ant bit me and this so and then the, so there are these chains of transmission that begin every hadith and the way that they evaluated their authentication is they looked and saw well could her grandfather have really met this person cited next and this person and what's one of them a known liar and you know all these different elements that went into whether or not they're authentic or not which is why there's so many different grades of them from you know sort of most sound to, to, to weakest so like I said I'm only showing you ones that have come from the sound collections the strong collections I guess it's just on the actual day of this happening the prophet would have said oh the, the ant beat me can you burn him and then a second later he would say actually don't the god just told me <laughs> yes so maybe think how it actually happened on that day yeah I think you have a career in you in, uh, in hadith <laughs> uh, so these these are questions that you know are discussed sort of at incredible length um, but we kind of have to take it on face value here one more yeah maybe just another aspect because we had heard it before that um, laws they distinguish between different animals and yes. here we have even an ant that um, yes. makes speak um, to his even ants. Oh, so, uh, pre, uh, pretend even the ants. Even ants. Even ants. Okay. Two here. The prophet cursed the one who treated animals harshly. The prophet passed by a camel whose stomach was taut, and he said, "Fear God regarding your treatment of these animals who cannot speak for themselves. Ride them properly and feed them properly." I think this is the. Um, uh, we'll only have two more after this. So. Uh, what do you think here? Have, have we left the rights territory completely? Or what do we want to make of this? Are we just like in welfare land now? <laughs> Nothing to say? Yeah, you said. Well, it's like paradigmatic welfare stuff. Yeah, it is. It's, it's classic, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's really classic animal welfare, right? Harshly. I mean, exchange that for any word from contemporary anti-cruelty laws, right? Um, these animals are for you to ride, for you to use, just make sure you feed them properly. So, right, it couldn't be more typical. Okay, sorry, this is long, all right, but it's fascinating, all right, so let me read it. The prophet said that among us there was a man who was traveling and he became very thirsty. So he found a well and descended into it and drank, then exited when he saw uh, a dog panting and eating the ground from his thirst. The man said, this dog has reached a level of thirst that I almost reached. And so he descended into the well and filled his shoe with water and provided the water to the dog. 
God thanked the man and forgave him of all his sins. The men listening to the story said, O prophet, will we be rewarded for assisting animals? The prophet said, there is the possibility for a reward for helping each living being. Classic welfare, or is there anything more that we could pull from here? Is it just classic welfare? <laughs> Sorry? Equality. Okay, say a little more. <laughs> the man and the dog? Yes, they're coming down to the dog's level. Yes. Yes. And that somehow the dog's thirst is maybe equally uh, equal to the suffering of the man. Their thirst is the same yeah. in a way. It's, it's the same kind of phenomenon. What else? Yeah. Uh, I was thinking this would be uh, either rights or welfare because it's virtue ethics. Talking about perspective, you know, from the perspective of the man. Yeah. yeah. There's virtue of the Yeah. Yeah, so maybe it's a, it's a virtue ethics, it's an ethical approach, yeah. It's, there's also a strong sense of incentivizing what's in it for me, really. Well, that's a good point, too. Uh, can, can we all get this? Do we all get this reward if we help a living being, as opposed to saying, um, wasn't this just a good deed, right? Like, can we, all get in, can we all get in on this? So, right, maybe there's part of it. Yes, in the very back. Maybe Sorry? Humanitarian interventions. Interesting. Interesting. A duty to rescue? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. He didn't have to, but once he did, he got rewarded. But maybe we could read something into it to say, if you don't, you might get a penalty. Mm -hmm. Right? And in fact, there's another one I didn't give you where a, um, a, um, a woman who was a prostitute, which is a sin, uh, rescued a cat and she went to heaven. So her, her sinful act was wiped away. By, uh, by saving a cat. Okay, Raphael's giving me a look. All right, so, all right, now, we're almost done with the hadith and then, and, then I'll, and then I'll keep talking. Every human being who kills a sparrow or any larger animal for no legitimate reason will be held accountable for it on the day of judgment. The prophet said that a legitimate reason is to kill it for food, not to discard it after severing its head. That's off the purpose. Lawful purpose? Pro proper, proper purpose, purpose. Yeah. right, right. Proper purpose being eat it. Don't, don't play with it, don't mess around with it, right? So we could probably jump ahead to greyhound racing. I mean, this is welfare-ish. It, it per makes food permissible, we already knew that, but it does also suggest some things are wrong. Some things are wrongful. Yeah, Charlotte. Isn't it interesting how the sparrow isn't it here? And the first um, source that you used, the bird was a herd? You know what? So that might just be um, uh, the, uh, the translation because there isn't, there isn't an it in Arabic. It's a, it's a he or a she. And I, I took these from a translation of these, these books. So I would have to go back and see. What they would do is the word sparrow is it a fe feminine or, or a masculine uh, noun? And then it would go along with it. So there is, th there is no it. Yeah, that I, sh I should have corrected that. I should have noticed that. Anything else? Yeah. I just wonder if it's only not to fill them for food, then I wonder if, say, animal testing that's lethal for the animal is permissible. So just wait. Our, 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 our uh, UK imam uh, is going to say absolutely no animal testing, p plus the mutilation one. Okay, ready? Uh, last one. The prophet said that God required being kind in all things. So if you kill, be kind in the killing. If you slaughter, be kind in the slaughtering. May I just ask what's yeah. the difference between killing and slaughter? What the terminology with the translation, what the two things mean? Yeah, so I think he's talking about war warfare, right? So uh, the first one could apply to humans. The slaughter is explicit for, uh, for an animal for purpose of feeding, of, of eating. So, so killing is humans and slaughter. Could, could be, right? It could be. Um, but that's, I think, what is mostly understood because it does lead to a lot of rules of warfare and laws, and laws of war. Right. Okay, all right. So 
the, there's many, many more on slaughter. So the legal scholars took these two sources and they produced legal doctrine. And so when I talk about legal doctrine here for the next few minutes, I'm really talking about classical legal doctrine from the beginning of these early periods to around, you know, roughly 15, 1600. That's kind of the classical period when a lot of the doctrinal issues kind of get worked out. It doesn't mean they were hearted and fixed. It just means once question has, has been answered and that answer has been repeated a lot of times, it kind of gets built up and it's a little, it's hard to undo it by subsequent generations. And I'll also note that the scholars, as you could tell right away, what they produced was diverse. There was not one rule on every topic at all. And this diversity was acceptable and even, and even celebrated. But one point they came to agree upon is that causing animals suffering and harm is wrong. And they didn't dispute the point that animals can be used by humans for transportation, for wool, for all the things we saw. But they didn't see just mere use as per se harmful. Um, the owner could do something wrongful, as we saw, by hurting the animal. But the mere use itself was not considered um, wrong. And so this distinction, of course, is very much an animal welfare distinction. Wrongful acts could include overloading a pack animal, mut mutilating an animal, um, and killing an animal, except, of course, for food. So, you know, hunting for fun, no, right? Th that would be very clearly covered by this. So these wrongful acts were considered sins in this kind of pre-nation state era when there's not legislation um, and when there's no state law separate from uh, religious law. When these wrongful acts did happen, some legal scholars try to conceptualize what's going on here. Uh, many didn't think about it, but some did. And so the, the ones that did, didn't talk about a right of the animal being violated, uh, such as with the bird or the mother bird or um, killing an animal other for, for, than for food, but rather they talked about rights of God. The idea that God's the creator of the animal and God holds the right. And so this is not necessarily an obstacle to animal rights, just because the scholars lodged the right with God as the creator. And I think this is a fascinating area that some real work could be done, like in a dissertation. But what I'm thinking of kind of at first glance is that there are other rights or entitlements of God, um, in the, but that humans carry out. Uh, humans can't waive them or dismiss them or say they aren't rights of God, they can't change that, but they can be the ones that sort of carry out the, the trying and the, pu and the punishing. And one example of this is the very strict and now seen as quite harsh criminal penalties. Um, this is the adultery penalty or cutting the hand of the, th the thief. These were seen as God's limits, like violations of God's law in a very strict sense, but on this earth, it is humans who try these cases and who, who punish them, even in the prophet's time. So likewise here, maybe the animal could be God's proxy and hold the right. And this has to be really thought out. Again, this is like a, like be a great dissertation project um, and thought about further. And uh, I do have a colleague who's working on personhood in Islamic law, and I really hope he can delve into these questions too of, could the animal somehow be God's proxy with the right? All right, but let me talk now a little bit about the killing for food before going on to the third section on uh, contemporary advocacy. So killing for food is more complicated. Uh, some scholars saw killing for food as just what they thought was part of general human dominion, because as I said, Sarah Tlilly is pushing against this idea that humans have dominion over all, over all animals. And they didn't think it needed any justification or discussion to talk about why animals could be killed for food. But there were some scholars that felt they needed a theory of why taking the life of an animal was acceptable, uh, a wrong, even a pain. I don't think they were talking about the pain of slaughter because I don't think they thought slaughter was painful. This is a whole nother discussion we can talk about later. But rather, they seem to be wrestling with the mere fact of the deprivation of life. How is it that we can deprive life for food? Why does God allow it? 
So there's been some good work on this question by Sarah Tillily, who I mentioned earlier, and my own PhD student, Nuri Friedlander, um, and others. And what they found is that some scholars developed an idea of compensation, that uh, God allowed humans to kill animals for food, and that's a, that is a, is a deprivation for the animal, but God will compensate that animal in the hereafter. Uh, and that it's the animal's kind of job on this earth to provide food for humans. But what it's important here is, for, is that there, for these scholars is a recognition that the taking of a life itself is a deprivation, but it's God endorsed. So this does become challenging from an animal rights approach uh, when it comes to farmed animals, but we'll see in a few minutes how people are trying to push back on that as well. All right, so part three, the use of, animal, the use of the, these traditional sources today to advocate for stronger interests or maybe rights. So two particular people, um, the one as I already mentioned, Al-Hafiz Bashir Ahmed al-Masri, who died in 1992. He was the imam of, the, of a mosque in Walking, England. Uh, and then the second person I want to talk about is just named Farah, and she's a Facebook phenomenon. Uh, I want to tell you what they've been able to do with the tradition. So Al-Hafiz Bashir Ahmed al-Masri wrote two books, and um, he's, in his first book, Islamic Concern for Animals, he's really interested in, in factory farming and scientific testing. And it, when it comes to, to testing on animals, he's absolutely, he absolutely rejects it. And he focuses on uh, the kind of language we saw earlier, the idea that it's a mutilation of the animal, that, um, uh, that, it's, uh, that it's harmful to the animal, and that it was never justified by God. And he says that uh, all life is sacrosanct in Islamic law, and he said that the criteria should be that any kind of medical or scientific research that is unlawful on humans is unlawful on animals. So we took a very hard, strict approach based on the sources that we just, uh, we just saw. Now, as for slaughter, so he really goes after factory farming and really tears it apart. And it's interesting, I would love to do some kind of intellectual genealogy because I do think he might have been influenced by Peter Singer. I would love to know if in his papers, because you know it's about 10 years later and Singer's really focused on factory farming and scientific testing and so is Mustry, but he really goes after factory farming. That's his, his target. But as for just the sheer act of slaughter, he says, well, Islamic law permits it, but you really have to be concerned with the welfare of animals, and he cites all the hadith uh, that I showed as, as other ones, such as sharpen the, anim sharpen the knife outside the animal's view, don't kill one animal in front of the other, all these hadith that deal with welfare in the slaughter context. So he then, in 1989, had done some thinking, more thinking, and he publishes this book, which is widely distributed and available online, and I think even CIWF uh, pu published it, it, was publishing it at one point. And so here, it's basically his first book uh, with a whole bunch more on, on animal consumption. And while admitting that Islamic law allows killing animals for food, he goes even further than he did in Islamic concern. He talks about the environmental unsustainability, the economic unsustainability, and the nutritional benefits of a vegetarian diet. So this is pretty amazing in 1989, a traditionally trained Islamic scholar, albeit living in the UK, talking about the benefits of a vegetarian diet. And he says, Islam has left the choice to the individual to be a vegetarian or a meatitarian. So, why did he not go further after this, this long diatribe against the environmental and other cost of meat eating? So perhaps he didn't believe anything stronger than that. Perhaps he thought truly it was the choice of the person. Um, maybe he thought his community would not accept him. He'd lose them if he said something that stringent. I'm sure his community were, were meat eaters. But perhaps there was a doctrinal reason. And this is what's often cited when this topic comes up, it's another verse from the Quran. Believers, do not prescribe the good things that God made permissible for you. And so this verse often comes up 
And the idea is that if God made something permissible, humans can't prohibit it. And so Mustry might have thought that, as a traditionally trained legal scholar, he can't really come out and say, meat eating is prohibited, because this verse really stands there as problematic when we all know that meat eating is permissible. Okay, I'm almost done. I want to turn to, to Farah. So let's play her video. It's six minutes. Um, I don't know a lot about her, but I feel certain she's not an Islamic scholar. I feel certain she did not spend five years, eight years at Al-Azhar Al University in Egypt. And I like that fact very much because the change is not necessarily going to come from the guardians of tradition. Um, it's going to possibly come from people like her. But it's very tricky to wade into Islamic arguments if you're not, uh, if you're not really prepared to deal with arguments against you. But no one fights her. So this is just her uh, for the most part. And then I'm going to just take apart some of the things she said and then conclude. And we may go a little bit, we, we may go into 50 minutes, but you might, you might allow that. OK. So if, if we don't get a, uh, a, a, an audio, it's OK, because it's, it's subtitled anyway. She's talking in Arabic. OK, go ahead. Yeah. Salam. أنا اسمي فرح وأنا من جمعية عالمية اسمها Anonymous with the Voices من كم يوم نزل الفيديو على الفيسبوك على صفحة اسمها ثورة المحرومين لشخص اسمه أحمد باكيش عم يحكي عنه اسمعوا شو قال أنه ما بيعرفوا كيف بدي هوجبوا الإسلام اليوم بشارع الحمراء شوية مهابيل يعترضون على زبح الأضاحي باعتباره تعذيبا للحيوان يا حيوانات حركتكم دماء البقر التي خلقها الله وأحلها للإنسان ولم تحرككم دماء الأطفال الممزقة والأجساد المحترقة في سوريا ألم أغضبكم الزبح الحلال ولم يغضبكم قتل السيران في أسبانيا للمتعة والتسلية ولله في خلقه شؤون يعني هذا اليوم بشارع الحمراء بس بدي أقول وين المجارع مراجع الدينية ترد عليهم الكل عم يتطور على الإسلام يوم صار زبح البقر حرام وقتل الأطفال بسوريا حلال مصارعة السيران وقتلهم وتعذيبهم في إسبانيا حلال وزبحهم على الطريقة الإسلامية حرام هلأ أنا كنت من اللي واقفين بشارع الحمراء وأول شيء تحب وضحه أنه نحن ولا بأي طريقة ضد الدين لأنه أنا ما بسمح لها شيء يصير وأكيد أنا ما كنت شاركت بهيك شيء أصلاً ثانيا نحن عم نتظاهر ضد قتل الحيوانات وضد التعذيب يلي بتعرضوا له كل الحيوانات البريئه وين ما كانوا لانه صحيح انه الله حلل اكل الحيوانات بس كلمه حلال مش يعني فرض يعني مسموح فقط اما الفرض يلي هو علينا فهو عدم اذيه النفس في فتوى بتقول كل ما يثبت بانه ضار بصحه الانسان فهو حرام وهيدا الشيء ضروري لانه اجسامنا ما هي امانه من عند الله وبوقتنا هلا اكل الحيوانات ومنتجاتها هي سبب كل الامراض المنتشره بعالمنا العربي واثبتت الدراسات انه اكل الحيوانات هي او منتجاتها هي اكبر مسرطن والسبب الرئيسي لامراض القلب والضغط والسكري وكل هدول عمر بن الخطاب قال اياكم واللحم فان له ضراوه كضراوه الخمر وعلي بن ابي طالب قال لا تجعلوا بطونكم مقابر حيوانات وأكيد الصحابة بيعرفوا بالدين أكثر, أكثر منا وهن حذروا من أكل اللحمة قبل ما يصير ما كان عندهم يعني الأكل النبات المتوفر عنا هلا بعدين ليكون الأكل حلال لازم تتطبق عليه تتطبق شروط الحلال على الحيوان من أول ما يخلق ليصير وقت الذبح مش بس فترة الذبح فإذا الحيوان تعذب بحياته ليوصل لهالوقت فهو بطل حلال من قبل ما حتى يندبح وبعض الأحيان عم يندبح الحيوان هو بعده كثير صغير ونحن بنعرف إنه هذا الشيء أبدا مش حلال وكمان بوقتنا هلا ما عم تتطبق الشروط الحلال بالمسالخ أبدا وأنت لازم تطلع عن قضية الذبح بالعيد لأنه الذبح بلع... الذبح بالعيد مش فرض بالدين الفرض بالدين هو إنه الواحد يوزع خيراته على الناس أما الذبح بالعيد فهو قصة عادات مش أكثر وكمان انفرض علينا أنه نحن ما نأذي الأرض يلي نحن عليها انكتب لازم عمارة الأرض 
بس هلا اكل الحيوانات ومنتجاتها هي السبب الرئيسي بنقص المي بالعالم نقص الموارد سبب تغير المناخ وكل هالاخبار هلا اهم شيء انا بدي اوصله وبدي اوضحه انه هي قضيه الانسان انا عندي سؤال اذا انا اكلت هلا حيوان بريء كيف بكون عم ساعد الاولاد اللي عم بيموتوا بسوريا هيدول موضوعين ما خصنا ببعض وإذا نحن طرحنا موضوع معين مش يعني عم نبرر موضوع تاني أبدا وإذا أنت شايف إنه في موضوع مهم لازم ينطرح طرحه أنت ونزال على الشارع واحتج مثل ما نحن نزلنا على الشارع واحتجينا وكل واحد بيطرح مواضيعه وما بنتهجم على بعض وهيك بيصير التطور الفكري وإذا أنت عن جد مهتم بأمور البشر لازم تعرف أنه صارت المنتجات الحيوانية هي السبب الرئيسي بظاهرة المجاعات وموت الأطفال من الجوع بالعالم كل هالحبوب والأكل بالكميات الهيلة اللي نحن عم نعطيها للحيوانات كرمال تنصح بشكل أسرع أسرع من الطبيعة ليش ما منطعميها للولاد اللي عم بموتوا من الجوع بالمجاعات آخر شيء أنا بحب أوصله بحب أحكي عنه أنه الدين نبهنا انه زمن بيتغير وركب علينا نحن المسؤوليه انه نواكب عصرنا لانه بتختلف المعطيات والشبهات والرسول قال انتم اعلم بامور زمانكم والدين نبه عن المفسدين بالارض وبوقتنا هيدا مصايب اللحم والضرر على الحيوان وعلى جسمنا وعلى الارض وكل هدول كله بخالف الدين والله عمل الانسان خليفه في الارض ومع هيدا الشيء بيجي مسؤولية انه نحن نفكر ونحن نعمل الشيء الصح والشيء يلي هو بيتوافق مع ديننا شكرا وسلام Alright, so she said a lot here um, I'm probably going to write an article on it uh, because it's just very, it's, um, it's really quite amazing uh, how much she weighs into Islamic law and the kinds of arguments she makes Maybe she exaggerates some things. Maybe her science isn't always right on point. But lo let's just look at meat. Okay, she recognizes it; it's permissible, but she does much more than uh, al masri. She doesn't say you decide. She actually says it's wrong, that it's obligatory to abstain from meat. Now she doesn't use the language of animal rights, although I suspect she would agree with the concept. But for reasons I explain, it's hard to get to animal rights in the farm animal context using the traditional sources because of the uh, God permiss uh, permitted killing. But she makes a modernist move in terms of Islamic law. She appeals to a more general principle of it's obligatory to avoid what harms you. And then she explains well, what's harmful about meat. She says everything that's proved to harm a person is haram. Haram means forbidden. It's the opposite of halal. Halal just means permissible. Um, she cites to authorities other than the prophet, namely two of his successors, uh, which is really interesting. They aren't as authoritative as the prophet, but she doesn't have a lot of pro prophetic hadith to draw from. But she cites two of his successors, um, one of whom said, it's not that, that meat is as harmful as uh, wine, but it's actually in Arabic as addictive. And the context of that seems to have been when there was a scarcity of meat, like don't eat it every day and don't get addicted to it because we don't have enough, right? So we're talking about um, 7th century uh, Arabia. And she talks about the need for Islamic law to change with the times um, and that the prophet said, you are more knowledgeable of the issues of, the, of, of your times. So she's employing these really key modernist arguments. She's, you know, kind of jumping over the, the, the legal rules and kind of going for big principles and, uh, and, and doing really important work that deserves a lot of thought that we can't get into completely today, except to say that the idea of appealing to general principles is fairly controversial because by doing that you could then just like wipe out almost everything. Um, but there is a concept of public interest or public welfare that has been used in contemporary issues and uh, it's, it's difficult to use and she's trying to appeal to it. So there's a lot more about what she said and we can talk about it in the question and answer. But 
in the interest of time, I just want to, uh, to wrap up by saying one final thing, which is that we, we see some strengths for animal rights, not a lot. Uh, but what's important to understand is that Islamic law is not fixed. And we've seen other examples where rules can change. Slavery is not required in the Quran, but it's permissible. It's no longer legal anywhere in the world. Okay, we know it's practiced, but it's not legal. Not in Saudi Arabia, not in any Muslim majority country. Polygamy, which is widely endorsed in the Quran, is abolished in some countries. And so it is not implausible to think that these kind of arguments could be pushed and pushed and pushed and ultimately really come out ahead with the right kinds of advocates. And so um, we need people like her, we need other scholars, we need scholars, uh, we need a deeper and a more coherent theory of animal rights uh, in Islamic law. I think it can be done, I think it needs a lot of work, and it can be very influential. Um, it is true that Islamic law is not national law anywhere in the world, but it can be very influential on national law. Let's say an animal testing law could be influenced by this, but it could also just be very influential on people's behavior. Mm -hmm.